You are sitting on a lonely chair beneath a bridge, holding out your hands for warmth at a burning barrel. Among the many things you experienced in hell, for some reason, this bridge overpass seemed to be the nicest. Rarely did demons ever come down here, and if they did, it was to fornicate or take random stuff together. As such, they usually were in a good mood and left you alone. Food also appeared almost on its own too, as just at the bridge's edge stood a small, run-down sandwich shop that threw out most ingredients at the end of the day due to freshness. The only real problem you had was the boredom. You were too scared to communicate with anyone. Heck, maybe some junkies would share with you if they saw your little body. Though pity was something you didn't expect in hell. Meek and powerless as you were, you didn't even look like a demon. You just looked like a wide-eyed girl with thin devil tail and white gray eyes. Sticks and leaves were permanently stuck in your hair. Your teeth were dull, so anything chewy like meat needed to be properly cooked. With deep jealousy you watched carnivorous demons eat each other. It looked tasty, but, well, not like your teeth could cut it, literally. You were chewing on a very juicy tomato. Its skin was completely broken due to it having been crushed in the trash can at the restaurant, leading to you doing a little mess. It actually didn't matter that much. You wore a very filthy makeshift dress you had made yourself out of a thrown-away blanket cover. As weak and pathetic as you felt, however, whenever you tried begging for any scraps, most demons just kicked you, pushed you away or spat on you, calling you a filthy little thing. Almost as if they got off to very specifically humiliating you. Only once had a demon shown you kindness. She was a hellborn imp, but even though living with her had been nice. She had been completely overfeeding you and showering you with attention. While that was fine, she entirely forgot her own child, a little baby imp. Feeling bad for the little thing, even though it was a demon... You eventually snuck away, back to the underpass. Sometimes you regretted the choice, but then you thought of the crying child. That imp mother probably had her maternal instincts in a twist over what to her seemed to be a second child. Maybe she didn't want to outright neglect her baby? Well, at least that's what your human side was trying to tell you to keep you sane. While every demon just referred to you as Drag, you actually didn't really feel that name. Though, the more often you heard it, the more you forgot the name that you had chosen for yourself to begin with in Hell. Drag, like that disgusting black crust after drinking coffee. Your small hand took hold of a stick that was leaning against the barrel. It was cooking a raw piece of fish that also had been cast aside by the restaurant. You bit into it and retched. Not only wasn't it fully cooked yet, you also didn't have seasoning. It took you some mental strength to not immediately discard it and curl up in a fetal position. Sighing, you brushed through that bushy hair of yours. Oh, baby, did I promise too much? This is the perfect place for you to snort some powder off my butt. Oh, hey, drag. What's a drag? From atop the bridge, two demons had slipped down. One was a tall horn beetle demon. The other, a familiar face. The adult video star, Angel Dust. He occasionally came by. Oh, that's just drag, some demon kid. Uh, no fucking with audience. Annoyed, Andrew looked at the demon's mandibles. They were very hot. And then he looked at you. Drag, honey, you mind? 
Wordlessly, you stepped off your chair, leaving your bridge behind. Hoping at least this time Angel wouldn't be doing his business on your mattress. You had left your last one smelling like salty fish and milk. And you had slept for two weeks on the ground until someone had thrown away another usable mattress in your area as a replacement. Weird little demon thing, muttered Angel Dust's partner. Yeah, don't get too close to her. I think you're gonna catch something bad. What does that mean? The spider shrugged. Basling. Grinning, the giant then grabbed Angel by the hip. Oh, whatever. Now where do you want me to give it to you? Meanwhile, you walk down the street with your arms tightly wrapped around you. It was weird. Whenever you felt alone, you were freezing, and though it was incredibly hot in hell. You were so sunken into your thoughts that you didn't notice a white limousine drive a car's length behind you. Sir, it is a facelift. I highly advise against associating with this vermin. In response, the driver only heard a sigh. I mean, we know it's a faceling, doesn't that, like, damper the ability or something? The imp snickered. Oh, no, sire. And if I were no better, I would say your insistence on this is an indicator that you're already charmed by her. The man in the back of the limo crossed his arms. Face links were exceedingly rare and quite dangerous demons, sinnerborn, especially to the hellborn denizens of hell. They had been an important cornerstone for hell's evolution to something more earth-like. As high-ranking torture demons had become too busy caring like parents for the puny little creatures to bother with the job they had been created for. Though the earthification of hell also led to the emergence of the exterminations. As such, it was now of utmost importance that a faceling was to never learn of their powers. Or else they could actually probably take control over hell entirely. But what made Facelings so powerful? You didn't have any physical strength. You could not make people explode with your mind, nor could you throw fireballs or summon shadow demons. Well, your power was the insidious ability of pity. Facelings awoke paternal instincts deeply buried inside of any sentient creature. It was especially dangerous to mothers of any kind. The demoness who had taken care of you, for instance, would have eventually killed her own child for neglect, if you haven't left on your own. The spell, the ability, the power of your pity was related to a certain aura of influence. A rough estimate was, if you could see the big white puppy eyes of a faceling, the spell worked. Worst of all, it also worked for video recordings and photos, all by on a much weaker scale. There were only very few demons who managed to resist the allure of a faceling. These included hellhounds of any kind and cannibals. This was due to the cannibals seeing facelings as a viable food source. And hellhounds, well due to their bestial nature, could quite literally smell the danger and therefore react accordingly. In fact, there were large groups of hellhounds who could be hired for facelink removal. So what was making the man in the limousine follow you, despite the danger that you very obviously were posing? You're immune, right, Prem? asked the man curiously. Of course, sire! What kind of butler would I be if I'd be influenced by such dastardly parlor tricks? Priminger's master shrugged. Okay, then you can always remove her should I start neglecting Charlie or my duties. 
prince's gaze moved up to the mirror. I really am ill, sire. How could I possibly dream of ever removing her, if you are the one standing in my way? I could never. The man's eyes narrowed. So did the butlers, as they stared at each other. The man knew Prim was capable of so so much more than any imp he had ever encountered. He would have fired him by now simply because of how suspicious he found him. But man, he truly was one hell of a butler. Prim, Charlie told me to look for a cinnaborn. I think this one would be suitable enough to be friend. And your first choice is quite literally a creature that uses peachy as a weapon. The man blushed. Just let me talk to her, okay? Prim slowed the car right next to you, but before the man pulled down the window to call out to you, he had a different idea. You know, Prim, I think this is creepy. Oh, is it, sire? I. Deserve that, I admit. Sighing, the man reached into his bag, pulling out a notepad, quickly writing a message. He then opened the window ever so slightly, folded it into a paper airplane, and threw it at you. And then he ordered the butler to speed the hell away. It was seconds later that the paper hit you in the side of the head. Confused, you grabbed it. It was just a short message, addressed to that little homeless girl. That, that was you, obviously. Written on it was a location, a street name in the upper class cluster of the circle. Something unique, Facelink Demon said, was a quite aggressive instinct or subconscious. While never fully aware of it, it made your kind do certain illogical decisions, such as you right now did, in following that letter. Any other demon would have seen it as a trap. But in reality, what your instincts were, were just the desperate need to actively use your powers. It was something you had no influence over, something... No, Faceling had influence over. The upper class cluster was a section in the city's outskirts. While in the human world, outskirts were usually reserved for slums and poor people sectors, this was a little different in hell. As the annual and now biannual exterminations started in the center of the pentagram, which meant that the center of the city was the most dangerous during any extermination event. Well, not like you had anything to lose. That was the good thing about being in your situation. Might as well do this, as there was nothing else you could. Taking your first step into the upper cluster was weird. You had spent the entire day walking through a hostile city filled with demons who despised you for... existing... But here, here there were actual green hedges, beautiful buildings made out of white marble. Ugh, it made you feel so dirty and out of place. As you slowly walked forward, the tonal whiplash of how beautiful this place was compared to the diseased city, it was palpable. You almost felt disgusted with the decadence on display here. The only good thing about the upper echelon was that these demons were so stinking rich, they had become extremely lazy. They rarely left their mansions, and they almost never interacted with each other, too afraid to lose face, as they called it. Only during their depraved parties did they actually act like demons, or showed any real free will of their own. Though sometimes they did take strolls making sure to never even look at the ugly city as they did so. While they were seemingly in control of everything, they failed to realize 
The wealth they had been granted in hell was actually a prison of their own making. As you looked for the street written round on the letter, you bumped at first into one of the aristocrats, a fat, unslightly demon with so much makeup in his face he looked uncanny, even to a hell creature such as yourself. His powdered wig, having so much powder on it, it looked like his shoulders were covered in a thick layer of dandruff. The demon needed to lean over quite far his layer of fat to finally make eye contact with you. His face was a mix of intrigue and disgust. Without much hesitation he grabbed you with his big sausage fingers, holding you up by your makeshift dress. Ugh, what do we have here? With his other hand, the demon adjusted his monocle. A father like a woman. You are shaking in his grasp. He pulled you closer, sniffing your neck before shaking his head. Ugh, such an uncouth smell. He shook his head. The demon was feeling the desire to wash you with his own hands? Uh, why would he bother with that? He had hundreds of servants to do that for him. Strange. Uh, perhaps he did find a little treasure under all that litter with you. And what I uh, Halborn, Cedarborn, Ugh. I so rarely deal with sinners, despite myself being one, of course. I... I... They call me Dreg. You said as quiet as a church mouse. Dreg! Ugh, such a disgusting name. But, very well. My name is Barnabas Mackenzie the Third. Somehow you doubted that. And what brings you here, little fig? You held up the piece of paper. Barnabas, swiping it away, holding the paper between two fingers, before dropping you on the ground. Once again, he adjusted his monocle. Oh, hasty hand, Ryder. But that address, yes, I know it. The demon's eyes widened. You have been advised by Lucifer himself, the king of hell. Oh, oh dear, you must have done something absolutely horrible. Your heart stopped for a moment. Did I? Yes, my dear. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but, perhaps, there's a way out for you. You shuddered, tapping your fingers together. I could keep the sight of my mind, yes, yes, I could. I could dress you up in little outfits and have you act like you're just my niece, who recently perished, who I took in because of such a nice guy. I, uh, I... You shook your head, jumping up, swiping the paper out of his hand. No, no, I, I, I think I... I think I would much rather see what the King of Hell wants with me. The demon's lips became very small as he looked at you. A strange feeling he had. Confusion as to why he even wanted to risk this danger for a disgusting little drag like you. And anger. For you resisting him. He went into thought. Sensing the growing danger from the fat demon, you took your chance and maneuvered around him towards any direction, really. It took Barnabas five minutes to finally realize that you had left. And by then, he was out of your cone of influence. Ugh. He swiped his hand over his chest with disgust, 
before gently tapping a handkerchief over his sweaty forehead. Why did I even touch that thing? Why would I train it so well too? This would only make me lose money. <laughs> oh, such a terrible moment. At least it is gone now. It was late in the evening when you stopped next to the dress on the paper. Your feet hurt from the hours of walking. And you're ready to fall asleep at any moment, really. Intimidated, you looked up at a beautiful castle. Nothing like the imposing black fortress you expected from someone who was called the King of Hell. But at this point, you're willing to accept anything in this place, as nothing really made sense anymore. With a pounding heart, you approach the castle, entering its courtyard unopposed. Surprisingly enough, from a door leading to the main stronghold, immediately stepped an imp, as if he had been waiting for you. Most imps were regular human-sized, so was he. He had red, shiny skin and short white hair. He was perfectly groomed too, with clear skin, polished black horns, and just a tiny bit of eyeliner to make his clear yellow eyes seem bigger and rounder. A tiny black eye-shaped tattoo was on his right cheek that seemed to blink whenever he did. He wore a somewhat tight-fitting black suit. Beneath, a white dress shirt with a black tie. Pearl white gloves were pulled over his clawed hands, and a golden chain hung from his breast pocket which was attached to a golden pocket watch. His pants were the same black as his suit and his feet were covered by shiny black leather shoes. His shoulders were quite broad, an indicator that beneath all this very professional getup, he was quite muscular. Your eyes fell upon his right wrist, where you could see just a little bit more of his unclothed arm. It seemed as if his entire right body half was covered by more of these strange eye tattoos. He opened the door for you with a deep bow. My master's expecting you, little one. He had a strange manner of speaking, making him barely understandable. The imp guided you through the castle. It felt quite empty and lonely. Are you the only servant here? Of course, little one. Oh, who else would you be expecting? Wait, really? You were completely taken aback. The task of taking care of Castle Morningstar is a trivial task for a bottle of my stature. You placed your hand on your head. You placed a hand on his head, slowly guiding it to yours. He wasn't that much taller than you. Though the butler visibly cringed at your touch and was looking at you with a professional glare. If you're done mocking my physical size, little lady. You blushed. I'm so sorry. This is my lord's workshop, he said. He made an elegant hand gesture before opening the door for you to enter. He bowed deeply before you and then announced your arrival. The honorable lady of whom my leash is fond of his finally arrived, sire. Please, enjoy yourselves. The imp gently closed the door leaving you alone in a rather cramped-up large room, cramped by hundreds of piles of rubber duck toys, of all things. Opposite to you stood a man, Lucifer, dressed in all white and red. He was quite handsome, blonde hair, yellow eyes, seemingly permanent blush. He definitely didn't fit the descriptions you heard of someone who was called the King of Hell. Awkwardly, he smiled. I, uh, 
I actually had planned a very dramatic entrance, but it seems as if Prim had other ideas. Um, what's your name? He wasn't tall, probably just a little bit bigger than his butler. He then approached you, taking one of your hands, gently kissing it as if he was talking to a lady of high standard. Blushing, you answered, It's drag. Lucifer nodded. Drag, right. You're probably wondering what is going on here. You looked down where he was holding you. His hands were soft, gentle even. Across his pearly white skin you saw a slight dense, an indicator that he had just taken off tight gloves, probably just before you entered. I... I suppose so, yes? You looked up into his face. It was strangely familiar, though, now that you were up close. Hmm, maybe he gave you a few coins once, probably while you were begging. That made sense. Well, for you, it was just a simple luck, I suppose. Uh, but, well, he let go of you and took a step away, swiping the back of his head in embarrassment. Uh, you see, my daughter Charlie, she runs this little hotel, the, the Haspen Hotel. Its goal is to redeem sinners. Curiously, you tilt your head. Are you here to redeem me? Sorry, sorry, probably a stupid question. Um, uh, no. Uh, see, a few weeks ago she said, my way of acting around my subjects, you know, sinners, is not, uh... He tapped his hands together as he thought of the right words. Favorable. You blinked. And not befit for a king. So she suggested I talk to sinners, to humanize them for myself, and uh, here you are. How unusual. Clearly he hasn't had many social interactions for a very long time. And uh, why me? Why not anyone else? You ask curiously. <sighs> that I don't know. He smiled. I suppose you just exhumed a certain level of weakness, patheticness that was easy to approach. You finish his sentence yourself. Yes. Well, at least he was honest. So what now? You asked. And Lucifer shrugged. Ah, uh, well, to tell you the truth, Drag. Um, I didn't think we would get this far. Why don't I show you the castle, huh? You were in no position to object. As such, he took you on a tour. The stronghold was in mint condition. The floors, shiny. The windows, spotless. Clean, beautiful paintings lined the walls. And even the carpets all seemed freshly cleaned and brushed. Lucifer himself was quite pleasant. Though considering he was the first heartbreaker to exist, this seemed to be a given. Though he did seem a little stiff and uncomfortable with the entire situation. Once again, you couldn't help yourself and you just had to ask. This place is truly a sight to behold, my liege, you stuttered. But it seems quite lonely. Lucifer blinked. I mean, Prim keeps the place clean. I don't see the issue. You're lonely. I'm just assuming that's why you chose me? Someone who's equally lonely? You blinked surprised. Why did you just say that out of the blue? Not even wanting to. Scared, you slapped both hands on your mouth, deeply apologizing. I'm sorry, I don't know what I was thinking. The King of Hell curiously looked down at you. You weren't wrong, though. And it scared him a little. 
Was it really that obvious? Nah, it wasn't. Was it? No, no. That's at least what he told himself. And he smiled. He actually smiled. Well, I suppose you're right, he admitted. Lucifer made your facing powers responsible for his honesty. I am lonely. He looked away, thinking. How about we get you to the dining room for a meal? As if waiting for this opportunity, your stomach rumbled loudly. I take that as a yes, he mused, while you blushed in utter embarrassment. The dining hall of Castle Morningstar was beautiful. The same white marble the rest of the fortress was made out of. And at a large table, you and him sat down. The chairs, so tall, your feet didn't reach the floor. Preminger brought food. Starting with a mild meat stew as appetizer, followed by a delicious steak with gravy and potatoes. Some salad on the side as well. I still don't understand why you're doing this, you muttered between bites. I mean, I'm thankful. I haven't experienced much kindness since I arrived. You tapped your fingers together. Am I being selfish? Confused Lucifer blinked at you. I mean, aren't there more suitable demons? Huh. The angel thought. After a moment of silence between the two of you, Lucifer thought of your ability and how it most definitely was already affecting him. But it wasn't like he imagined, or like he had been told it feels like. Perhaps him having angelic origins weakened the effect. He wanted to take care of you, yes, but he still found Charlie to be more important than you. If anything, his feelings for you, as of this moment, felt a little more romantic rather than paternal. He wanted to explore that. Placing a hand under his chin, he looked at you with a smile. Drag. As I said, you're just very lucky. I mean, just look at yourself. Your reek of trash, your teeth are in terrible condition, you have leaves and sticks sticking out of your hair, you're starving. You bit your lower lip. Go on, just accept it, all right? In this world, there are winners and losers. And you just won. For once. Plus, if the first sinner I invited home for dinner ended up being one of those foul-mouthed bastards only think of themselves, that would have instantly discouraged me to do what my daughter asked me to do. So, I suppose we're both winners now. Quietly, he added, Well, this is the reason I wanted a faceling. You nodded slowly. I guess I can accept that. After the meal, you spent the rest of the day together. He showed you most, if not all, the rooms in the castle, even the dungeon. Lucifer specifically skipped the bedroom his wife used right before the divorce, and you didn't really feel like prying in. What mostly surprised you was when he pushed you into a decently sized room with a large double bed and some basic furniture. Tell me, what do you think of this room? Your questioning expression was rewarded with a sigh and a chuckle. <laughs> For you, that is if you want to stay at my court. You chuckled darkly before bursting into all-out laughter. Where's this coming from? <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. I was, uh, I was just thinking about my mattress. Confused, Lucifer tilted his head. I mean, if you want to bring it. You raised both hands defensively. No, 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 no. I, I can explain that later. Angel Dust was probably done on that thing by now. Well, great, I suppose. Um, I'll leave you alone for now. If you need me, I'm in my workshop. 
As you watched him leave, you wondered how close this arrangement with him was to what his daughter actually wanted or meant, really. For you knew he completely missed the point of what his daughter wanted. For you knew he completely missed the point of what his daughter actually asked him. But this was all just ending with you getting free things, so why complain? The first thing you did was close the door behind yourself and go to the room's bathroom. The castle was way, way too big to have just one of these, and as such, each of the ten bedrooms in the castle had their own small bathrooms. And finally, after two years since you left the imp lady's house, you could take a shower. Strangely enough, the stank had eventually gotten not so bad, though still present. Perhaps you just got used to the grime, though. With a rapidly beating heart, you watched the black-gray sludge give away to clear water beneath the hot stream of water. Your tiny hands rubbing over your naked body. How something as normal as cleanliness became luxury. Something rare. In your time as a human, you just took this for granted, really. Hell, even the soap that was here, while clearly meant for just hands, it, it just smelled great and you used it to help clean yourself. 30 minutes later, you stepped out of the shower with a great light feeling around you. Though there were still sticks and leaves in your hair. And you doubted you'd ever get rid of them. You opened the dresser in your room. Oh well, empty. Understandable. And then an idea came to you. Maybe you could... Wrapping the towel around your chest, you stepped outside. What seemed to be your room now. Cautiously you walked through the halls, your wet feet pitter-pattering over the carpet. You roughly remembered the location of Charlie's bedroom. Maybe you could borrow some of the clothes she left behind before moving into the hotel. But as you opened the door quietly, you saw Lucifer. He was looking into Charlie's dresser, as weird as it seemed. It probably was out of the same reason you came here. In your shock, you forgot to grab the door, and it audibly shut, causing him to jump and look at you. His face flushing immediately. Ah, uh, I, uh, um... I, I'm sorry, sire. I was wondering if maybe I could borrow some clothes. He averted his gaze. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought the same. She left stuff behind that's too small, but according to her has too many memories for her to throw away, so I, I thought we could use those. Slowly you approached, tightly holding to the knot of your wet towel. You looked into the dark dresser. When he still averted his gaze, she stood next to you. You were slowly exhaling through your mouth. When your instincts finally took over again. Absent-mindedly you let go of the knot, letting your arm hang down. It only took gravity a minute of silence to do its thing. And such, with a quiet thud, the towel dropped. Normally you'd be terrified being naked next to a stranger, but whatever this thing in your brain did, it knew what it was doing to Lucifer. And it wanted him to lose his control. And so, seductively, you leaned forward, your butt raised ever so slightly. Your heart raised, pounding so hard you could hear it echo in the dresser. Your hands taking hold of a red little shirt with a fitting black dress stuffed beneath. But then, your body cringed, as you could feel Lucifer's gloved hand brush over your rear. 
his fingers exploring her ass. You could feel that his eyes are focused solely on you. Your reactions. As if he was waiting for you to protest. Maybe he even wanted you to, but... Instead, you slowly pulled your upper body out of the dresser, turning to face him, looking up, your grey eyes meeting his yellow ones. You placed a hand on your chest. Would you like to touch me more, sire? You asked with a slight deadpan. You wanted to smile because of the awkwardness, but your body didn't obey. Instead, it reached for Lucifer's wrist. The last time your body acted fully on its own was when you lived with the imp lady. It was so scary that the moment you regained control over yourself, you fled. You took his hand and placed it on your chest. His hands twitching. You narrowed your eyes seductively and then the two of you kissed Lucifer's lips were a little coarse a sign he didn't lose lip balm a lot that however didn't change that he was a pretty good kisser he was very active his lips touching yours moving gently wiggling and slurping. It was enough to make a grown woman like you go weak in her legs. <sighs> and then your tongues touched. First only fleetingly, but then you went for a tender, wet embrace. Your tongues tasting delicious. Neither of you made a sound outside of the wet kissing noises. His hands gently sliding down from your shoulders to your butt. He squeezed tightly, finally causing you to make a little noise of pleasure and pain. And that's when he picked you up. His arm wrapped around you. He kissed you again on your forehead as he carried you to the bed. Gently laying you down on it before he opened his belt. Hey, thank you for watching my video until the very end. But before I say goodbye, I would like to shout out all of my lovely channel members Hella, Bitbit, Bit, Melofia. Anonymous Weep, Sleepy Town, Angel, Zachary, Nicodemus D, Ash Wisdom, Ikea, The Tribute, and AJ Anime Girl for being wonderful Tier 2 and Tier 3 channel members. And of course, a big thank you goes out to my Tier 1 channel members, your wonderful, wonderful little mates.